Assalamu alaikum. Today's topic will be the eye. A general overview of all the parts, including the muscles, the glands, the supporting ligaments, and the layers of the eye. After we complete the overview, we'll then look at all the various diseases affecting the eye. Now, what you see in front of you is actually the left eye. And the reason I can tell that is because of the positioning of the lacrimal sac and lacrimal gland. The lacrimal gland will always be upwards and laterally, and in this case, the top left, while the lacrimal sac will always be on the medial size. It will extend from the eye and drains in towards the nose. So let's look at each of these individual parts of the eye. Now, the foremost layer of the uh, eye itself, I we're talking about the eyeball, I'm not we're forgetting about the uh, eyelids and the muscles, we'll ignore them for now. But focusing on the eyeball itself, we have the sclera. It's a white fibrous layer consisting of connective tissue. It forms the bulk of the outer layer of the eye. And it also extends all the way back till the optic nerve. And this sclera also ends anteriorly right here where it forms the cornea. The transparent part you see in front, too far again, here let's see this. The transparent part you see in front is actually the cornea and this margin is the limbus where the sclera and the cornea meet. On the inside, the innermost layer is the retina. There is a layer between the sclera and retina, we'll get to that. The retina is where all the blood vessels and the cones and rod cells are placed. What you see here basically is the optic disc. This is where the optic nerve enters into the eyeball. And this is the impression left by that nerve. It's a blind spot because you don't have any cones and rods here. And here you have all the ciliary arteries extending to form retinal arteries right over here. You'll see later on in disease such as diabetic retinopathy, these are quite broken down, wool-shaped. And in cases of hypertension, how thick they are, that you can actually use the retina to diagnose multiple conditions. And where the retina ends in front, we call this the aura serrata because it's a serrated margin. The layer between the sclera and the retina, which I mentioned, is the choroid layer. It is basically a pigmented layer, a lot of pigment here and vessels. This is what actually gives, nourishes the retina. You need the choroid layer for the retina to function properly. And you can see there's no choroid layer at the optic disc, but it is extending all the way from the back till the aura serrata region. This is your choroid layer. Three layers, sclera, choroid, and retina from outside to inside. The conjunctiva is a transparent layer covering the sclera, but keep in mind that it extends from the lids till the exposed part of the eye only. You won't find the conjunctiva all the way on the back. This part near the lids are known as the palpable, and the ones covering the anterior part of the eyeball, the bulbar part. And these are the ones which get inflamed in conjunctivitis. But these are also covering the eye in the front, except at the cornea, the cornea, its own place. The sclera, however, that has a conjunctiva here. Those sometimes you may notice in your eye, thick blood vessels after a long day of not resting or stress, but those blood vessels are actually found in the conjunctiva, not in the sclera. The cornea on the hand, as I told previously, the transparent layer in front of the pupil of the eye, distinct from the sclera and the conjunctiva. And this is the transparent part. And notice, it is not flat. It is actually has a bit of a bulge towards it. And this is where the maximum refraction of light recurs. Lens also refracts a lot of light, but cornea also has its own refractory power. Right in the center, if you were to divide this part into the anterior chamber and behind the lens is the posterior chamber, the lens is sandwiched in between. Anterior chamber also has its own fluid, posterior chamber also has its own fluid, aqueous humor. The lens is sandwiched nicely in between and is suspended by the ligaments, which are not really visible here, but those ligaments are attached to the ciliary processes and muscles, which will get to that. And the lens itself changes shape depending upon the pull of these muscles. The iris is the colored part of the eye that we appreciate. It's all muscular and filled with choroid. 
it, it is actually a diaphragm much like you have a diaphragm between your thorax and abdomen so this is also an aperture like diaphragm which allows light to pass through the pupil but the rest of it is all muscle and filled with choroid material and you can see it is directly in front and overlapping a bit of the ciliary processes and the ciliary muscle here you can see the ciliary processes these are the ones which secrete the aqueous humor as well as they attach to the lens via the zonal ligaments which are not again shown here and depending upon the pull the lens changes the shape but keep in mind the edges of the silly process these are the ones exclusively involved with the secretions of the aqueous humor the muscles on the back side those are the ones which are the ones which will pull right over here you can see nicely two different layers of the ciliary muscle the inner constrictor muscles which causes the constriction of the pupil and the outer dilator muscles these are the ones which pull on the lens through the fibers the edges right over here these sausage like appearances you see here these are the ciliary processes exclusively involved in making the aqueous humor aside from that here they were trying to show the ligaments again but again um, I guess we can focus on these a bit if possible that's a little difficult it's not really nicely made here so we can ignore this for now. Hyaloid canal is a small remnant during the embryological life. Uh, when the eye was forming, there was a small pathway for a hyaloid artery that supplied the structures in front. But then that uh, artery uh, disintegrates and you have this canal left within this vitreous body. Just a remnant of the embryological eye. Optic nerve is from the back. It is the second nerve, cranial nerve. And it extends along with the meninges. As you can see, it's covered with meningeal layer. And these meninges also cover a bit of the eye. So any of the crease in cerebral spinal fluid will affect the eyeball on the back. Blood vessel, as I mentioned, you have the central retinal artery and vein passing right in between the optic nerve. And these enter into the eye to divide into all the multiple retinal arteries and vein. There are also ones which are visible on the outside and ones which are present only on the inside the short and long ciliary arteries lacrimal sac as I mentioned is found near the medial side of the eye near the nose all the tears produced by the lacrimal gland will drain into the lacrimal sac there are actually the whole list uh, steps of pathway into the lacrimal lake into the punctum into the lacrimal caniculi and then finally into the sac right down into the nose via the inferior meatus via the nasolacrimal sac and here you can see that they've also highlighted the lacrimal canaliculus which connects the punctum present on the lacrimal lake on the medial side of the eye all of the fluids come through here here's the lacrimal gland and you can see how the lacrimal gland has its extensions from which the lacrimal fluid the tears are produced and this is all innervated by your facial nerve actually the parasympathetic component of the facial nerve, the lacrimatory nucleus. Mobian glands are glands present in the eyelids, which secrete a waxy-like layer to lubricate not just the lids, but as well as the eye. When you constantly blink, there's also, aside from the tears produced, the Mobian glands also produce their own secretion to keep the lids smoothly flowing, as well as the hair from sticking together. And sometimes these can be inflamed to get a chalazion. This is basically a little bump you might notice on the eye. So that is known as a chalazion and that is the inflammation of the Mobian glands. Other glands like glands of Z's which are, when are, are inflamed, then you get a sty instead. We'll get to those clinicals later on. One of the largest muscles covering the eye is the orbicularis oculi, innervated by the facial nerve. This is involved in tightly closing the eye. Remember, your blinking is not controlled by this. This is when you tightly close your eyes. And this is a, exclusively supplied by your facial nerve. Orbital septum lies behind the muscle and is like a barrier which uh, prevents infections from entering into the eye. Any infection goes inside can lead to orbital cellulitis, a very dangerous disease which can lead to blindness. So this is your orbital septum. It attached to the bony rims of the orbit of the skull. And you can see it nicely forms a barrier right behind the muscles. 
Here's your levator palpebrae superioris. This is your blinking muscle. This is the one which pulls your upper lid. Remember, your lower lid is not really moving, it's your upper lid. And this muscle, which is supplied by the oculomotor nerve, pulls on the upper lid and closes it as well. You can see how it attaches directly into the upper lid, right from above. Then the other external muscles of the eye, superior oblique. The reason they call it is also uh, because it passes through a trochlea right over here, a bony ring. And that's why they also uh, label the nerve which supplies it as a trochlear nerve. And this muscle is involved in looking downwards and laterally. So basically your uh, intorsion movement. On the other hand, the inferior oblique is involved in the extortion movement, which we'll get to that. Here's your inferior oblique. Look at the exact opposite pulling angle from superior oblique. So here's your extortion movement. And the remaining, you know, lateral rectus for lateral deviation of the eye, medial rectus, medial uh, deviation of the eye, inferior rectus looking downwards, and superior rectus, which is right below levator palpebrae, looking upwards. And the trochlea, as I mentioned previously. Tarsal plates, once again, are basically fibrous uh, septum, which are giving support to the eyelid, and they're found right in front of the muscle, but within the skin. The mammobian glands are located onto them. They're, again, made of fibrous connective tissue, gives shape to the eyelids, and also are protective. Some other, basically, advanced uh, ligaments that you give support to the eye, you don't need to know them for now. But again, if just for the purpose of uh, completion, capsulopalpebral fascia, located right below the eyeball, and the inferior oblique muscle passes right through a small slip formed by this ligament. Again, lateral palpebral ligament, medial palpebral ligament, supporting structures of the eye. Not much else to mention here. Another supporting ligament, superior transverse ligaments. The important ones you need to know are the orbital septum, the tarsal plates, the medial and lateral palpebral ligaments only. Suspensory ligament of the eyeball as well as small ligament located on the side. And with that, we're done. We don't have to look at the eyelashes. On the next video, we'll be looking at all the clinical conditions involved with the eyeball.